Ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for joining us here at the American Enterprise Institute on this uh, beautiful spring morning. Thank you also, those of you who are watching online from home or from work, and those of you who are watching by television. I'm Nick Eberstadt, uh, the Henry Wendt Chair in Political Economy here at AEI. And I think we've got an interesting and enjoyable uh, session for you this morning. Um, at AEI, of course, it is a tradition to reserve April Fool's Day for the discussion of particularly misbegotten public policy issues. And this morning, uh, we're going to be discussing the question of nuclear nonproliferation agreements with state sponsors of terror. You will recall, those of you who have long memories, that this is not a, uh, a new question for Washington, D.C. If we go back to the early 1990s, the U.S. was attempting to craft an uh, arrangement with another uh, would-be nuclear rogue state. Um, back in those early days of history, uh, the administration in Washington realized it would be impossible uh, to craft an arrangement that would be approved by uh, legislative branch. And so it devised something which it called a uh, agreed framework instead. Um, I don't want to spoil the suspense for you, but after several decades of somewhat hapless uh, negotiations and discussions. The, uh, uh, the state sponsor of terrorism in question uh, became a declared nuclear power and detonated several nuclear weapons. Um, this morning, we're going to be dealing with uh, also a second, uh, a second state sponsor of terror uh, with which the US government is currently in uh, deep negotiations in uh, Lausanne, Switzerland. And we have a, a magnificent panel here to discuss the similarities and differences, and also what one set of would-be nuclear powers may have learned about uh, negotiations with another set of would-be nuclear powers. Um, at, the, uh, at the dais here with me is Dr. Michael Rubin of AEI, the author of uh, Dancing with the Devil, book about the perils and pitfalls of negotiating with rogue or uh, revisionist states. Dr. George Perkovich, the Vice President for Studies uh, and a uh, widely cited authority on uh, nonproliferation and nuclear strategy at our friendly competitors up the street, the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, and uh, certainly uh, not least, but last, uh, Ambassador John Bolton, our cleanup batter here at AEI on all manners of uh, international security questions. Uh, former U.S. Ambassador to the U.N., former uh, Under Secretary for State of State for Arms Control and International Security, among many, many other accomplishments. Um, I thought that maybe we'd uh, start off by asking uh, Michael to say a few words and then go across the panel, see what we wish to discuss uh, up here at the table, and then open up the discussion uh, to the uh, to the room as a whole. So, Michael, please begin. Thank you very much. As some of you know, I spent about 14 years in a Quaker school in Philadelphia, and then another nine years in an Ivy League bubble. And so I really, in my upbringing, didn't really have much contact at all with the U.S. military. And it was ironically only after I left working in the Pentagon, and I started w teaching to U.S. military units deploying to the Middle East uh, or on aircraft carriers, that I first learned about the culture, really, of the military, that the, our men and women under arms tend to get, spend more of their time getting their rear ends chewed off by chiefs or sergeant majors or in the classroom going over lessons learned from any particular exercise with the goal to make themselves better soldiers, sailors, and pilots. And yet, when it comes to the State Department, we really haven't done a comprehensive lessons learned exercise 
about the success or failure of our high-profile diplomacy with rogue regimes for more than 50 or 60 years, at least. And that's one of the reasons why I had tried to do it myself in um, a book which the new edition just came out a couple of weeks ago, uh, looking at the patterns with regard to American diplomacy with rogue regimes and terrorist groups. Now, I'm a historian by training, an Iranian, a 19th century Iranian historian by training. And so I get paid to predict the past, and I'll be the first to admit I only get that right about half the time. But when looking at the past with regard to diplomacy with both Iran and with North Korea, there are certain patterns which jump out. Uh, in some ways, history repeats. And even though Albert Einstein didn't really come up with the adage about insanity, the, the wisdom is true that insanity is doing the same action repeatedly, but expecting different results each time. Now, on October 7th, 1994, that was a day when and acid was in short supply in the White House. And the reason was the South Korean president, Kim Young Sam, had given an interview to the New York Times. And this is in the run up, the last weeks before the agreed framework, in which he, he basically criticized the logic of our engagement with North Korea. And I quote, if the United States wants to settle with a half-baked compromise and the media wants to describe it as a good agreement, they can. But I think it will bring more danger and peril. We have spoken to North Korea more than 400 times. It didn't get us anywhere. They are not sincere. Now, Kim Young-sam got the Netanyahu treatment before it became the Netanyahu treatment. It highlights a pattern that when the goal has become reaching that agreement come hell or high water, we're never going to get allies, let allies get in our way, and we're never going to recognize that when allies want to intercede, it's not to ruin diplomacy, it's to make it stronger, it's to put a check on what otherwise might not be a good agreement. Now, likewise, sometimes we're quite bad at introspection. On March 13th, 2002, so more than 13 years ago, then-Senator Joe Biden spoke to the American-Iranian Council. And he said, with regard to the ideal of, idea of engagement with Iran, and remember, this is just about a month and a half after the so-called axis of evil speech, we must also be willing to hold discussions with Iran to develop creative solutions as we did with North Korea. And eight years later, simply, Joe Biden hadn't realized that the creative solutions with regard to North Korea weren't exactly successful solutions, um, that the engagement had, had pretty much failed. Now, after the agreed framework had been signed, North Korea almost immediately began diverting heavy fuel oil. Um, Gallucci and his team, they wanted to put a positive spin on this. And this is also part of the pattern of American diplomacy with rogue regimes. They said that the fact that North Korea was doing this, and I quote from their book, was will it was willing to look for ways to stretch the limits of or evade the terms of agreements, but that also demonstrated the North's ability to turn on a dime and to take surprising steps to resolve potential problems that might undercut its broader interests. Now, it's off the topic of Iran and North Korea, but it actually reminds me of some declassified documents with regard to American diplomacy with the Taliban, that when the Taliban back in the year 1997-1998 refused to hand over Osama bin Laden, the State Department actually said, well, this is actually, there's a silver lining here because the fact that they actually responded to us means that they're interested in dialogue and so we can go forward with a peace process. We all see where that worked. Now, last but not least, I'm an Iran watcher by training. That's what I used to do in the um, Office of Secretary of Defense more than a decade ago. But one of the things which is most interesting to me is how the Iranians actually look at North Korea. And I'm not going to talk about the recent news headlines with regard to what their activities might be. But Hussein Mousavian, who's now at Princeton University, used to be a nuclear negotiator for Iran under Hassan Rouhani back during the 2003 to 2005 period. And what's actually quite interesting is he had argued that their 2003 to 2005 agreement was um, decision to negotiate with the Europeans was actually a success because during these two years of negotiations, we managed to make far greater progress than even North Korea. And so when you look at North Korea as an example to emulate, 
rather than an example to condemn, perhaps there's something wrong with our diplomacy. But I hope I've been provocative enough to start with. Let me turn the floor over. Okay. Uh, I think when looking at comparisons, it's an important to have a framework uh, first, which is that to understand that there are multiple players. So just as in the agreed framework, there were multiple players. So the DPRK, the U.S. Executive Branch, the U.S. Congress, South Korea, Japan, and other and others. Uh, with Iran, there will be multiple players in any deal. There will be uh, different factions in Iran. There will be different factions in Washington. There will be Israel. There will be Saudi Arabia uh, and others. And any of these players can affect uh, the outcome. The second broader analytic point, I think, is that you want to look at a potential agreement uh, from at least two levels. One would be capability. So what are, what are the elements of an agreement that would constrain the development of capabilities, in this case of Iran? Uh, and the other is intentions. Are there elements of an agreement that may shape their motivations uh, in terms of the kinds of capabilities they would be motivated uh, to get? And when thinking about the DPRK and, and Iran, I, I've, I've kind of come up with a list of differences and similarities. And I, I won't probably have the time to get through the whole thing, but let me just give the highlights to put on the table for discussion. In terms of differences, Iran does not yet have sufficient fissile material for one nuclear weapon. The DPRK did have sufficient material for at least two weapons before that agreement was negotiated. The proposed deal with Iran explicitly addresses all pathways to the bomb. Enrichment, plutonium, uh, weapons-related R&D. Uh, this was not the case with the agreed framework, which focused uh, just on plutonium. The agreed framework was a 2.5-page document, the kind of treaty that John used to like to negotiate. Uh, nice and short, uh, don't overdo it. It's anticipated that if there's an agreement with Iran, in fact, it would be quite a detailed uh, agreement, precisely learning from some of the uh, consequences of, of uh, inadequately defined agreements. Another difference. With Iran, the P5 are unified in wanting to prevent Iran from acquiring nuclear weapons and have actually worked in harness to, to press it diplomatically. Uh, this is quite different than with the DPRK negotiation, where China had a different set of calculations, uh, certainly, than, than the U.S. Uh, did, and where the U.K. and France really weren't important in that negotiation, but are very important uh, in the negotiation with Iran. Another difference. A final agreement with Iran presumably would be codified as a Chapter 7 resolution under the UN Security Council, uh, unlike the bilateral US DPRK agreement. And having it under Chapter 7 has an implication for enforcement and for deterrence, uh, unlike with a, a bilateral agreement. Another difference. The verification that's envisioned with Iran would be unprecedented in its scope and intensity, much greater than with the DPRK. For example, the plan, as I understand it anyway, is that uh, Iran's activities related to enrichment would be begin monitoring uh, at ore mines and the mining process to the milling process all the way through any activity related to uh, enrichment as well as the production of centrifuges uh, themselves. If that comes to pass, there won't have been any kind of detailed verification regime like that in prior uh, experience. Another difference, U.S. intelligence capabilities, including cyber and overhead, have improved enormously by orders of magnitude since 1994. Also, Iran has been penetrated by intelligence agents from Israel and perhaps from the United States uh, in its nuclear program. Uh, in response to a U.S. military attack, Iran could not immediately cause massive military destruction of major cities in countries that are U.S. allies, as the DPRK could have with uh, Seoul in the early 1990s. On the other hand, Iran could sustain asymmetric warfare in many locations for a long time. Another difference, Iranian leaders greatly fear nuclear proliferation by their neighbors, especially Saudi Arabia, and believe that if Iran acquires nuclear weapons, it will greatly enhance the probability that Saudi Arabia would too, uh, perhaps with U.S. complicity, which would be a huge net loss uh, for Iran. Another big difference, Iran does not need nuclear weapons to guarantee its government's survival or to compel economic payoffs to it, very much unlike North Korea. Iran has very good prospects of economic growth and international recognition if it makes and keeps a nuclear deal. Again, a big difference. 
representatives of an elected government are conducting the negotiations for Iran and part of the policy shaping process as well. They campaigned for a nuclear deal and won a surprising majority. If sanctions are relieved on Iran, there's a significant constituency in the country that would be mobilized if the government acted in ways that caused sanctions to be reapplied. A nuclear deal with Iran will not call for full normalization of relations, which the agreed framework with North Korea did. Big differences, key U.S. friends in the Middle East fear a deal and eventual normalization with uh, Iran. This wasn't so with the DPRK. And finally, Israel opposes any deal with Iran that Iran would plausibly agree to, whereas Israel was not a factor in the DPRK uh, negotiations. Finally, on similarities, and I'll, I'll, I'll whip through them. Uh, like the DPRK, the government of Iran does and will continue to do condemnable things. It will support Hezbollah, Islamic Jihad. It will urge a referendum of all the people living in Palestine, which presumably would mean the end of the Zionist state. Uh, it will violate human rights. It will support Shia communities uh, in neighboring states uh, that have Sunni uh, uh, undemocratic governments, um, which heightens the fear of instability. Very importantly, like the agreed framework, implementation of a deal with Iran will require at least passive cooperation by the U.S. Congress. And like with the agreed framework, you have a majority, a Republican majority uh, in the Congress uh, that loathes the occupant in the White House. Uh, and so that makes it very unlikely that you would get the necessary cooperation needed for the U.S. to implement its side of the deal uh, over time. And this will be especially true as linkages will be made to issues that are not part of the nuclear deal, as happened with the DPRK. So missile testing, uh, treatment of dissidents, and so on, can uh, be used uh, as, as linkage in a way that wasn't envisioned in the deal, but that can blow up uh, the deal. Like the DPRK, the Iranian regime will not disappear on a timeline that's more rapid than the timeline by which it could acquire nuclear weapons. Uh, and as with the DPRK, and I think this is a huge point, the nuclear negotiations have involved give and take rather than compelling Iran to comply with the IAEA, UN, and other demands without inducements. And the framework of a negotiation, rather than one of a strict compliance uh, frame, uh, rewards bad behavior. And, and that makes it very difficult uh, for people here and elsewhere uh, to support it. Uh, finally, like the DPRK, the theocratic leaders of Iran fear that the United States will not stop trying to destroy uh, their regime. So that also affects their calculations. And then Russia's attitude toward the U.S.-Iran relations is a bit like China's attitude toward U.S.-Korean relations was. And we can unpack that. Let me stop there. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Thanks to all of you for coming today. I wanted to talk about uh, the subject of economic sanctions uh, and what effect they can have, uh, how they've played out in the context both of the North Korean and Iranian nuclear weapons program, uh, important not just for the comparative value, but because many people who oppose the Obama administration's negotiations uh, with the Ayatollahs over the nuclear weapons uh, issue have said that economic sanctions can solve the problem of a nuclear Iran. This is fundamentally false. Uh, let's take a look at the first, the theoretical circumstances in which sanctions can work. Uh, I think they can work when they are comprehensive in scope, covering all areas of economic activity. Uh, I think they can work when uh, all countries adhere to the sanctions. Uh, and I think they can work when the sanctions are rigorously enforced, including by the use of military power. They can. That's the theoretical case. Uh, but even sanctions that meet that test have failed. Uh, I would say that the sanctions regime, for example, imposed on Saddam Hussein after the invasion of Kuwait in 1990 were comprehensive, pretty, pretty uniformly adhered to, not, not totally. Uh, and rigorously enforced by the United States Air Force and Navy, which did a very good job. But they were not enough to compel Iraq to withdraw from Kuwait. And it was our judgment that they would never have been sufficient to compel Iraq to withdraw, at least before everything of value in Kuwait had been boxed up and shipped to Baghdad. So 
even the theoretical case uh, is, uh, is hard to make. The sanctions that have been put in place over the years in different forms, from different forms, for both Korea and Iran uh, have failed miserably. They have not been comprehensive, uh, they have not been uniformly adhered to, uh, and they have not been adequately enforced. In the case of North Korea, at least before its July 4, 2006 ballistic missile launches, breaking its moratorium on launch testing that they uh, self-imposed in 1998 and before its first nuclear test in 2006, the sanctions were largely American, largely unilateral. Uh, and just to fast forward, that of course is the threat by opponents of the Obama negotiations in Congress. It, by God, Congress will impose stricter sanctions. But American unilateral sanctions don't work. They're easy to evade. The North Koreans were expert at evading them. Uh, and even after the Security Council imposed sanctions uh, twice in 2006, uh, the North Koreans continued to receive assistance. They continued to be able to participate in international financial transactions. They continued work on their nuclear and ballistic missile programs to the point where they tested two other nuclear devices. We constantly hear rumors of the test of a fourth. Uh, and both American and South Korean commanders predict that North Korea's ballistic missile program is making sufficient progress that in fairly short order they'll be able to mate a nuclear device with a ballistic missile that can hit the west coast of the United States. So, so much for sanctions in that case. Now, what about the case of Iraq? The sanctions that have been imposed in light of Security Council decisions by European Union and others. You mean Iran? You said Iraq. You Sorry. Iran. Thank you. Appreciate it. In the case of Iran, uh, have been uh, far from comprehensive. Uh, there have been partners that Iran has used routinely to evade the sanctions. You know, they don't publish their economic statistics uh, on evasion in the Wall Street Journal, so it's hard to know uh, exactly how successful they've been. Uh, but we know it's happening. We know oil is going out of Iran. Uh, into uh, Iraq being shipped out as Iraqi oil. We know it's going out through the Kurdish areas uh, of northern Iraq into Turkey. Uh, we know that countries are engaged in counter trade with, uh, with Iran to avoid the financial side of the sanctions. I think it's fair to say that the economic sanctions have caused pain in Iran. Uh, that's true. But what has caused more pain in Iran is 35 years of misguided economic policies, the lesson of which is don't let religious fanatics control your economy, number one. And number two, most recently, the international collapse in oil prices. Uh, the pain that has been caused by the sanctions in Iran uh, is not something that moves the Ayatollahs. You know, they're not consumer society kinds of guys. Doesn't bother them that their people can't buy iPhone 6s. Uh, and that's not likely to uh, change. They're willing to bear the pain, and most importantly, there's simply no evidence that the sanctions have slowed down the nuclear weapons program. The Director of National Intelligence, General James Clapper, uh, has testified to that effect uh, in open session of Congress. So that the, the sanctions that we have seen have caused Iran to come to the table to get relief from the sanctions. Well, no kidding. What else would you expect? Uh, but they have not caused Iran to make anything other than trivial and easily reversible concessions on the nuclear program. So the idea that we have somehow, through a combination of diplomacy and sanctions, uh, brought the North Korean and Iranian nuclear weapons programs to heel is just flatly wrong. And if we proceed on that basis, whether this deal gets signed in Geneva today, April Fool's Day, June 30th, July 31st, August 3rd, it doesn't matter. Uh, Iran is on a course to get nuclear weapons uh, at a time of their choosing. Thank you. Gents, thank you all for this uh, <laughs> excellent start to our discussion. Before we open up to our audience for a general conversation with our table, I'd like to abuse my uh, prerogative as moderator to ask uh, each of our speakers a particular <coughs> question. And I'll just uh, go through the questions and uh, ask you to address them as you choose. Uh, Michael, um, you're, a, um, you're a specialist on Iranian politics. Uh, can you tell us uh, if there is any spectrum in Iranian politics that is not in favor of eventually having a nuclear Iran? George, um, you listed uh, 
a very interesting list of similarities and differences between the two situations here. One of the differences I'd suggest is that uh, the DPRK didn't have the opportunity to learn from the Iranian negotiating experience, but the Iranians did have the opportunity of learning from the DPRK negotiating experience. Um, what in particular do you think the Iranians learned in their negotiations from watching the DPRK uh, episode, let's say? And John, um, uh, among your uh, many accomplishments, you are also, I think, maybe the only person at AEI who has uh, argued in front of the Supreme Court and argued successfully. Um, I w I'd like to ask you a constitutional question. Um, some would say that the Obama administration is attempting to, uh, what we say, uh, lock the Congress out of the cockpit in the negotiations that are ongoing now. Uh, is, it, uh, is it constitutionally valid for any administration to come to a nuclear deal with a country like Iran or the DPRK that doesn't involve uh, uh, advice and consent from the Senate. So, anyhow. Okay, great question, Nick. Um, and it, it's a very, a very, very savvy question. Oftentimes, you will hear the question phrased when it's before an Iranian audience, do you believe that Iran should have the right to nuclear power and nuclear technology? And overwhelmingly, the Iranian people will say yes. There's been only one instance inside Iran that I can find in the open sources. Dates to 2006, and it was picked up in Radio Free Europe, in which a Tehran think tank asked the question, would you feel more secure if your leaders had nuclear weapons at their disposal? And two-thirds of Iranians said no, they would feel less secure. That think tank was subsequently closed down. But if I can just add, and this is where I quibble a little bit with Dr. Perkowitz, the idea that Rouhani has democratic legitimacy on this, I find troubling in a couple ways. First of all, it assumes that the Iranian elections are free and fair, but let's put aside the fact that 99% of the candidates who declared their desire to run were disqualified before they could get on the ballot. Rouhani is known inside the Iranian political spectrum as the fixer. He was the guy who was appointed in 1988 to lead the Supreme National Security Council um, as the regime loyalist who could guide Iran through the economic minefield. Now, he's also, in his campaign commercials, took legitimacy from the fact that he is the first person inside the Iranian political spectrum to refer to Ayatollah Khomeini as Imam Khomeini with a capital I in this case in the English context, meaning almost a messianic figure. Um, rather than promote reform, he's simply taken the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps elements from the cabinet and replaced them with Ministry of Intelligence elements. So in effect, what he guides right now is a KGB cabinet. Now, the other question with regard to nuclear weaponry, and I'll, I'll conclude with this, is that we often talk about what we know in Iran, but seldom do we spend time on what we don't know about Iran. So for example, I'm sure everyone in this room has heard talking heads or diplomats talk about hardliners or reformers in the Iranian political spectrum, but we don't talk about the factional breakdown within the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. Now, it's important not simply to talk about Iran's nuclear program, but to consider the command control and custody of that nuclear program, which would be within the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, at least on the military or the PMD elements of any nuclear program. Now, herein lies the problem. Even if we accept that Rouhani and some elements of the Iranian people want to resolve this nuclear question. The people that would control the aspects of the nuclear program about which we are most concerned have dis expressly refused to participate in any sort of, or, or lend credence to any supportive negotiation. And even the Supreme Leader himself, um, it would be, we'd be hard pressed to say that he has endorsed this because when he talked about heroic flexibility as it was translated into English, of course, there's religious implications of this going back to the Battle of Karbala, which don't necessarily come out in American diplomatic favor. 
and also his own office talked about how this represented a change in tactics and not a change in policy. Just to clarify, I didn't say it was democratic. I said it was an election, and, okay. and he ran on a campaign saying, I want to make a nuclear deal uh, to relieve sanctions. So it's not inconsistent with everything that, that okay. you said, and he won a surprising, okay. surprising mandate. Uh, on, on Nick's question, um, yeah, I mean, the Iranians did get a chance to learn from what happened with the DPRK. We also got a chance to learn what happened from the DPRK. And I would say that uh, one of the lessons, and they learned, they've also learned from Libya. And one of the things that they've said about Libya is Gaddafi gave up his nuclear weapons, and then look, he got whacked. Uh, and so I think one conclusion is if you have nuclear weapons, you're very unlikely to get invaded and whacked. The problem for them is they don't have nuclear weapons. And so the question is, in, in, in using that lesson, is in order to go from where they are today, with the monitoring and everything else on them to actually get to weapons, it's highly likely they're going to get whacked. And so the North Korean option may not avail may not be available uh, available to them. the The lesson that they point to actually is Japan. And also, what would you rather be, Japan or North Korea? Especially if you're Persia, a great civilization. So Japan has a a, a much greater resonance for Iranians because it's a great civilization, it's a great economy, it's a great regional power. And the U.S. cooperates with Japan in having a plutonium program. And there's a latent capability that Japan has that all of its neighbors can calculate that if you went to a major warfare with Japan, Japan would be able to make nuclear weapons if they needed to. And so what I hear from Iranians is Japan is a model, actually, that suits us. We want to have a fuel cycle. We want it to be legitimated by the U.S. just as you legitimated uh, with Japan, and by the way, with India. Uh, and, but we don't want to make nuclear weapons. We'll have a <laughs> capability that our neighbors will draw the proper conclusions from without the liabilities of having nuclear weapons. And so I think that's what I've found uh, Iranians would say when you talk about the difference between these two. Well, before I address the next question, let me just say what I think the lesson Iran really has learned from North Korea, which is get your nuclear weapon clandestinely and then announce it after you've got it. Uh, that, that's the way to do it, and I think that's one of the biggest problems with this, uh, with this agreement. But on Nick's question about what the president may or may not try and do with the deal if and when he ever gets it signed, uh, instead of the uh, verbal narrative that the British Foreign Secretary was, uh, was uh, talking about uh, the other day, uh, you know, we don't know everything that's in this deal, but if uh, there is a, whether it's part of the PERM 5 plus 1 agreement or a side deal where the United States makes a, in effect, a commitment not to use military force against Iran, a kind of non-aggression pledge, which I would hope even John Kerry would negotiate to be a mutual non-aggression pledge. But if there is that kind of pledge in there, I think that could cause the agreement to rise to uh, the level of a treaty that would require uh, Senate advice and consent. Uh, it may well be, in the absence of that kind of provision, that this is an, a, an executive agreement that can be uh, entered into without uh, congressional participation, and I think people need to be realistic about what's happened over the past 50 years. By most counts, uh, uh, international agreements that the United States has entered into since World War II are 90 percent at least, in some cases the count is higher, 90 percent at least are executive agreements and not treaties. The Senate has walked away. Uh, in many respects from its responsibility, and it's pretty hard to grab it back uh, simply in uh, one exercise here, uh, that you can, you can have a lengthy argument about whether we ought to be doing that, but that's what our conduct has been. So uh, when we hear outrage from the Senate, including from uh, conservatives and Republicans, uh, there's an institutional failure at work here, uh, uh, both on the part of Congress and successive executive branches, that have allowed this to happen. So I don't think it's so important um, what, uh, whether the Senate actually gets a shot at this or not. I think in many respects it's a diversion from where I think the debate should be, which is what a wretched deal this is. Uh, now, I think we've got uh, about uh, as much as 20 minutes for uh, questions and discussion with the audience. Um, 
We've got uh, relatively few strict rules in our discussion, but uh, this is one of them. Uh, please uh, identify yourself when you uh, get the mic. Uh, we'll uh, need that for any transcript that we develop from this session. And also, please end your um, question with a question mark. Um, I see in the back, please. Um, Mario. Thank you very much, Nick. Mario Loyola, National Review. Um, I, uh, so I, I think one of the lessons of the agreed framework is that uh, President Clinton should have bombed Yambian in 1994 when they started discharging uh, the reactor pool at Yambian, and which was really the last moment in time that you could interdict the program. And one of the lessons of the Iranian nuclear saga is also that Clinton should have bombed Yambian in 1994. Uh, and so, first, so that, I have a two-part question. My first is, do you, does anyone on the panel have a reaction to the consequences with respect to Iran of not having interdicted the, the, new, the North Korea program in 1994? And second of all, specifically to going back to 2006 when Ambassador Bolton uh, was at the Security Council, uh, I, things moved very fast at the Security Council. Once things landed on Ambassador Bolton's desk, there were a series of resolutions, very um, grave resolutions for Iran. Um, but it seemed to me implicit, uh, there was at least a tacit agreement if you listen to the statements of Security Council members when those resolutions passed, or at least it was inherent in the entire scheme, that force was sort of off the table in the short term as long as there was a prospect of an, a, a, a increasingly stiffer sanctions. And so I wrote at the time in National Review back in 2006 that this seemed to me like a green light. Uh, and did that come up, uh, Ambassador Bolton, for you, uh, the implicit sort of taking force off the table in the short term? And how did the administration deal with that at the time? Well, going back to Yang Bian in the 1990s, you know, I think it's uh, the circumstances of the North Korean program uh, are obviously different from the Iranian program because of the uh, presence uh, very near the DMZ of large civilian populations in South Korea. Uh, and so any military action against the North Korean uh, nuclear program uh, would have to take that into account. And I think with respect to any reactor in particular, uh, it's only vulnerable before it's been fueled, or at least it's only susceptible to attack, from my way of thinking, before that, because otherwise you risk the uh, uh, effects of the radiation spreading uncontrollably. So that's why Israel bombed the Osirak reactor before it was fueled. It's why they bombed the El Kabar reactor in Syria before it was fueled. Frankly, it's why they should have bombed the Bushir reactor in uh, Iran before it was fueled. Uh, and once we learned about Yangbian's existence uh, with fuel in it, uh, I would not have attacked it at that point. I think the answer in North Korea uh, was never going to be the use of force because the South Koreans were never going to agree to it. I think uh, in uh, 2006, both with respect to the ballistic missile test and the nuclear test, uh, the uh, belief we had was that, uh, that, that, that the next step would be going to China and saying in a very serious way, uh, the six-party talks have failed. It's simply been an excuse for North Korea to continue to make progress. Uh, and I would have hoped we would have been aiming for a policy once described in the title of a Nick Eberstadt book that was a favorite of mine, the title of the book being The End of North Korea. The policy should be reunification. That's what we should be getting the Chinese to do. I don't think that would involve military force on our side. I don't think it would work in the context of the North Korean program. Uh, I do think it would work in the context of the Iranian program because I think it's different. I'm actually going to take a, a tangent of that question with regard to the use of military force. During the hostage crisis, the original problem we had with the Islamic Republic of Iran in 1979, the hostages were, of course, seized more than nine months after Ayatollah Khomeini came back to Iran. They were seized on November 4th, 1979. Now, there was an emergency meeting at the White House that day in which the Carter administration decided to solve the problem diplomatically and take military action off the table. One member of the Iran team decided that it would be a good idea to leak this to the New York Times. And so the New York Times leaked, um, printed that military action had been taken off the table. 
what we know from the Iranian hostage takers, from their memoirs and from Persian language interviews with them, is that when they read that military action had been taken off the table, what had been originally a 48 to 72 hour sit-in turned into 444 days with a much enhanced set of demands. Sometimes it's important to keep military action on the table if you want diplomacy to be successful. One other quick point, if I may. I can think of two times when the Iranians have taken extreme positions and re from which they said they would never step back, and yet they've stepped back. Number one was what it would take to release the hostages, and number two was what it would take to end the Iran-Iraq war. To release the hostages, once they were released on the first day of Reagan's presidency, a lot of officials said, oh, it was the um, persistence of diplomacy that mattered. But the late, great Peter Rodman wrote an article in the Washington Quarterly in which he said that's nonsense. It was Saddam Hussein's invasion of Iran which made the cost of Iran's isolation to be too great for them to bear. So question one is, in our policy towards Iran, what are we doing to raise the cost of Iran's isolation? Now, in 1982, the Iranians had more or less pushed out the Iraqi invaders. And Ayatollah Khomeini at that point in time, according to declassified Iranian documents, was considering ending the Iran-Iraq war, uh, agreeing to a ceasefire. The Revolutionary Guard came to him and said, no, we need to achieve our war aims, which was not the liberation of Baghdad, but the liberation of Jerusalem, which should say something. At any rate, six more years of stalemate, another half million people dead, and finally Khomeini got on the radio and he said, it's like drinking a chalice of poison but if I want my regime to survive, I have to take a sip from this cup, and he agreed to a ceasefire. So question two is, what in our policy is equivalent to forcing the Iranians to drink from a chalice of poison? I'm not sure whether giving $11.9 billion in unfrozen assets is, especially when one considers that the official budget of the Revolutionary Guard is around $5.6 billion per year. Well, I just quickly, I mean, I, I, keeping a military option on the table is different than your question. Your question was actually using it, and there's a huge leap between those two things, number one. Number two, the poison chalice. Well, that was about 400,000 Iranian dead. I don't know how many Iraqi dead. I don't know if we're prepared to do that again. We've run that experiment uh, between 2003 and however many uh, years ago in Iraq. And so I, I don't know if there's a military option that is simultaneously of a scale like that that we would or should undertake um, that would motivate Iran. If it's something less than that, much more like what Israel did in Osirak uh, and in Syria in 2007, um, the, the question you have to ask yourself is how long would that set back Iranian, uh, Iran's nuclear program and under what circumstances? And I think a lot of people who've looked at it have said, well, it would set it back for a short time, but it would uh, drive it underground, take away whatever uh, uh, monitoring has been there, and, and remove the sanctions regime that has been useful in a, in a variety of ways. And so the calculation has been that isn't as good an option, as, at least as trying a diplomatic option. Whether that's right or not, we'll see. It's actually my turn to quibble just for a second. The poison chalice is analogous. It doesn't necessarily mean outright invasion. Indeed, uh, I tend to oppose. Uh, for the reasons you just said, military action on Iran, because if it just delays without actually having a policy in place to take advantage of that delay, then ultimately you're, it's an irresponsible use of the U.S. military to kick the can down the road. But when the Iranian economy had shrank 5.4 percent before we actually sat down at the table with them, I'd argue that leverage, unfortunately, shouldn't have become a dirty word as it has uh, under the current negotiations. We've got time for a few more questions. Can I see hands out there, all right. Um, let's see, uh, right here, please. Thank you, Adam Turner with the Endowment for Middle East Truth. And I just wanted to ask about the demographic crisis in Iran and how that affects uh, the Iranian regime, because I would think it makes them very dangerous. Um, if I may, I mean, one of the first things which Ayatollah Khomeini did when he led the Islamic Revolution was to ban contraception. And poet Farhad Kazemi, University of Connecticut, has, has written about this. But one of the first things which, I mean, what happened was posters went up all across Iran which showed a good Iranian family with a mother, a father, and seven children. And that made sense when you wanted to have a quantitative military edge, when you wanted 14-year-olds to sweep across minefields to clear them of mines. Now, economists kept saying, hey, we have war, we have revolution. And 
we can't sustain this. And Khomeini used to wave them off and say, we didn't have a revolution over the price of a watermelon. But by 1988, he kind of concluded you could. And he hit the holy books and discovered that condoms were legal after all. And so posters went up across the Islamic Republic that showed a mother, a father, and one child. Well, the long story short is the birth rate now in Iran is about half of what it was in the 1980s. And when you do the math, when you, math, when you look at the 2009 election of unrest, most of the people out in the street were in their 20s. They represent the height of the baby boom. There's an assumption in the West too often that when you have that with this youth bulge, once the genie of reform is out of the bottle, it can't be put back in. But when you read something like Sobi Sadak, uh, the Revolutionary Guard's weekly newspaper, they argue, you know, it's going to get easier to control things the longer we can hold out because there's going to be fewer and fewer 20-somethings as people um, start families and they're going to be too risk averse to come out to the streets. Khomeini, and this is both in Persian and in English on his website, has given two speeches about demography in the last year because it is such an important issue. And unfortunately, it doesn't necessarily trend towards the idea of reform. One other point about uh, demographics in <laughs> I Iran. Uh, the birth level in Tehran today at about 1.4 uh, births per woman per lifetime is about the same as the birth level in Lausanne, Switzerland, where the negotiations are taking place. It's been a big change. Leave it to Nick to know that. <laughs> uh, we've got a question over there with Josh. Josh Good at AEI. <clears throat> I wonder if you might comment on the quantity of time that uh, Secretary Kerry has spent with uh, Zarif. Um, it seems as though the, 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 um, the talks the negotiations have gone on uh, longer than we anticipated, and yet again, gone on longer than we anticipated. What's the personality dynamic perhaps involved there, and how's that compare with, say, Lavrov? Well, it's not my idea of a good time, that's for sure. Um, <laughs> you know, I think ultimately uh, people overstate uh, the impact of the personal relationship. Uh, I think uh, diplomats uh, who are successful uh, behave in a professional fashion uh, uh, throughout. Uh, and fundamentally, at least in countries that base their foreign policies on national interest, uh, as, uh, which I think the Iranians do, as opposed to ideology, which is what I think the Obama administration is basing its position on, the, the personal interests don't, uh, don't prevail. Uh, I think Lavrov uh, is probably uh, the most effective negotiator among the five permanent members' foreign ministers, and uh, the fact he's left uh, Lausanne tells me he thinks things are in great shape from their point of view. I would just, um, I've known I don't know Secretary Kerry, but I know a Foreign Minister Zarif uh, since 1997. And he's, um, he's a delightful guy. I could totally see spending a lot of time with him, not necessarily negotiating uh, productively, but just he's one of the funnier, most clever people I've ever met, uh, so I, which isn't how I would describe John Kerry. But, I, but it's um, – You said it, not me. I, but, I, but I think he's – that's not a surprise to me. I think you know, the question is what's being accomplished, but in terms of spending time with somebody – yeah, absolutely. Uh, questions? Yes, uh, uh, Dana Milbank from The Post. Uh, Mr. Rubin, had, I think just at a moment ago, you were uh, not necessarily supportive of military action uh, in Iran. I was wondering if that was a difference of opinion with Ambassador Bolton. And so, so you can write a story about disagreement at and, AEI. Well, I, I'm sure that's never occurred before. Um, <laughs> uh, but I just, but, but, but to the larger point, what is the solution if negotiations don't work and sanctions don't work and maybe even military power doesn't work, rather than like hide under our desks? Okay. Well, if you want me to put on my nerd cap to start with, first of all, we've got to stop assuming that the Islamic Republic is the natural pinnacle of Iranian political evolution. Many of the books that are taught in universities and also frankly read by the CIA were commissioned in 1980 and 1981 um, at, against the backdrop of the Islamic Republic. And many of the authors, Nikki Keddy, Irvand Abrahamian, for example, had argued that we have all missed the signs and we should recognize this. I argue that the Islamic Republic, number one, was more of an accident than anything else. Now. In military um, 
strategy centers, they teach the dime paradigm where every strategy should have a diplomatic, informational, military, and economic component. I don't believe that over the last quarter century, the Americans have had very much of a coherent strategy. Now, if you want specific ideas, and on the informational aspect, you have technologies such as UltraSurf, where to a I'm developed in part by the Broadcasting Board of Governors in order to help um, bypass firewalls. Now, it doesn't eliminate firewalls, but it raises the cost of censorship. So for every $10 million or so we spend in server capacity for this technology or those like it, it costs about $100 million to restore. You also have issues. Um, I mean, the Middle East, for, aside from Israel, forget the idea of NGOs in the Middle East. You don't have NGOs in the Middle East. You have gongos, the government-operated NGOs. Now, an exception is actually, ironically, also Iran, where you've had the development of independent trade unions starting in 2005. The Bush administration missed the Lekwalensa mo moment when Mansour Osanlu, uh, the head of the bus drivers union, the Vahid union, um, basically called a strike over non-political stuff. I mean, back wages, working conditions. The Kehan newspaper, um, whose editor is appointed by the Supreme Leader, said there is no strike as millions of people waited in line for buses in Tehran that never arose. Well, why is it, for example, if we're, there's so many partners, that the European Greens are so willing to support organized labor everywhere except in authoritarian countries? And we could be doing much more. The, the basic point here is that Rather than spending $20 billion trying to figure out who the guy in Tiananmen is going to be who's going to stand in front of the row of tanks, I'd much rather create a situation, an atmosphere in which someone is willing to do that. Now, that doesn't mean working with Iranian opposition. I tend to oppose that because most of the Iranian opposition groups uh, outside Iran are 40 guys in a newspaper sitting around and drinking coffee. But and I'm certainly not one who supports the Mujahideen al -Khalq. Um My own experience in Iran, when I, I did my dissertation research there, uh, back in the 1990s, was that they had absolutely no support. People looked at them like they look at um, John Walker Lind in the United States, the American Taliban. Um, but ultimately, you have had any numbers of sparks over the past in Iran. 1999, when it came to um, the protests that started with defenestrating students at the Mirabad dormitory. 2001, when it came to um, rumors that Iran had forced its football team to throw a World Cup qualifier to Bahrain three to one so that men and women wouldn't party together in the streets. And then 2009, in a situation like that, um, I'd basically argue, first thing we should do is do no harm, not throw a lifeline to a failing regime. And again, I note, 5.4% decline in their economy, according to Hassan Rouhani and the Central Bank of Iran, in the year before we started the negotiations with them. If we could get the Republican Party to support organized labor, I would be for that. So <laughs> We've got time, I think, for another question. If uh, Yes, ma'am. Yeah, my name is Li Yang. Uh, about the war and peace and different opinion, even in the United States, it's not just Republican or Democrat, but I think the general public. So I just wonder exactly what's the maybe social cultural difference, maybe Iran and North Korea, and also uh, the general public in the United States. Exactly what's the opinion they have, what's the basis that they have different opinion? Wait, no, she was asking what, what, what's the basis for, uh, for the different opinions that people have in North Korea, Iran, and the United States, right? And, and, and then the approach they take, whether they're peace talking or, or, or the Right, yeah. I won't try. I, it, it, it's a huge question, and I don't pretend to have an answer, and I think there's a lot of variety. I mean, there's a lot of difference, and, and usually in polling, anyway, it comes down to... Uh, you know, they're pretty sizable uh, bodies that take a different view. So it's 60, 40, or 55, 45, so it's close. I would just say one of the peculiar things in, in, in my experience in Iran, and I don't know if Michael, uh, you know, would echo this or disagree with it. I, I, it's a fair question. But in the cities where I have been, the, the 
people you meet are very pro-America, uh, surprisingly so, more so than probably any other country I travel to, and that includes a lot of, especially a lot of Western countries. Um, and it, and it, I'm not sure where it goes back to, but it's, it's, and it's not necessarily support of the U.S. government, but just in terms of general affinity uh, for the United States and a desire for normalized relations. It, people will stop you in a store, in a park, uh, walking down a sidewalk, uh, and and say that. Now that doesn't mean uh, it doesn't give you an outcome of a negotiation, but it's a, it, I think it's fairly widely. Uh, felt and I, but I in this country I don't find people have a, a lot of horrible things to say about the people of Iran or anything else. They don't like the government, but I think there's a, a reservoir of goodwill. Let me just build on that a, a little bit. Uh, first of all, one of the things I can I, I'm most concerned about when it comes to American diplomacy with rogue regimes is the idea of projection. And multiculturalism isn't just about appreciating our differences. It's not about walking into a sushi restaurant and being able to order a mojito. Fundamentally, it's recognizing that different people can think in very different ways. And yet, it seems sometimes there's a tendency, especially if one speaks English, to project our own value system onto them and assume that uh, we're negotiating from the same framework. Now, putting that aside, when it comes to the Iranians, I, I've certainly, yeah, they used to call me Pesari Shaitani Bozorg, son of the great Satan, but at the same time, I had a very positive experience when I was in Iran. But there are differences between northern Tehran or central Tehran, where a lot of foreigners go, and western Tehran, for example, which tends to be much poorer, and that's where a lot of the Revolutionary Guard families live, or Islam Shard. But what actually concerns me most about the future of Iran, should by some magic wand you have a regime change is in the intellectual history of Iran, you have a great deal of, um, I mean, unrestrained leftism. You can go back and xenophobia that predates the Islamic revolution. You can go back to the 1960s with the book which has been translated into English, but um, Jalal Ali Ahmed, uh, Garbzadegi, or West Toxification. Uh, you can look at people like um, um, Shariati, Ayatollah Shariati, who sought to combine some of the elements of, if you will, even Marxism with Islamism, because that was very much um, front and center in the public discourse. So if there is a change in Iran, I would see while many, many Iranians would be positive towards Americans on an individual level, I see it analogous as India in the 1960s, with a fierce superstition and nationalism, although not to the same degree of um, potential destruction that we have now. Yeah. And, uh, and of course, lest we forget, uh, public opinion is still a fairly underdeveloped science in North Korea. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we've got time for one more, uh, one more question. Thank you very much. Very insightful uh, session. My name is Daniel Kaderbekov, uh, Rumsfeld Foundation. My question is concerning the sanctions. You have a uh, number of times repeated that sanctions are not working. And considering the um, pro, I mean, uh, American um, perception of Iranians, Iranians are perceiving American culture and uh, globalization pretty well. Uh, and considering the failure uh, of the previous um, uh, sanctions and uh, considering that the totalitarian and authoritarian leaders, uh, they tend to, uh, they tend to, uh, at any cost, uh, pr uh, move forward with their agenda when they are not given a face saving exit from the situation, they will uh, make the situation even worse. Consi uh, I mean, uh, take a look at the example of the Soviet Union uh, collapse. Uh, th there is a small proverb, when you chasing and cornering a rat, if you don't let an exit, it will attack you. So in this, in this situation, do you think instead of sanctions and uh, threatening with military force, US and the Western community and international community could uh, uh, deliver an economic aid package to uh, make an economic development within Iran and the region, which will eventually, I believe, lead to political changes, maybe towards democracy? I'd, Thank uh, you. I'd like to give all of our speakers a chance to address this question and also to offer any final comments or thoughts. Okay, I'll, I'll limit my final comments to an answer to that question. It's that whole Albert Einstein adage before, 
One of the reasons why the Iran situation is so complicated is because there is no magic formula. And indeed, much of which we're doing now has been tried before. You can even take, for example, President Obama's inaugural address and eight days later his Al Arabiya interview, uh, outstretch your hand and unclench your fist, and compare it to George H.W. Bush's uh, inauguration, let's let bygones be bygones, this cycle of enmity need not continue. Um, there's a lot of parallel. But in answer to your question, yes, it's been tried before. In 1992, Klaus Kinkel uh, initiated this idea of critical dialogue. And a few weeks after that, you had the assassinations at the Mykonos Cafe of Iranian dissidents in Berlin. You also had between 2000 and 2005. This is again at a time when Hassan Rouhani was uh, secretary of the um, National Security Council in Iran. You had um, Mohammad Khatami in control. Uh, not in control, but he was president, the dialogue of civilizations guy, you had European Union, Iran trade almost more than double, almost triple. And during that period, the price of oil had quintupled. So Iran got a hard currency windfall. And they invested it in their nuclear and ballistic missile programs, which is why today in the internal Iranian debate, it's the so-called reformist camp that claims credit for advancing the Iranian nuclear program to where it is today. So simply showering them with love I don't think is going to do the trick. Indeed, it could make it much worse. I, yeah, I, I agree with that um, for the most part. I mean, I think whether it's deterrence, diplomacy, what have you, there's, there's an element of pressure and coercion to try to get someone to stop doing something that's dangerous to you or to move in a different direction. And where, where I do agree with you is in, with that pressure, there has to become it has to come with it an incentive for them to actually do what you wish, because if it's all pressure and there's no benefit from actually relenting, it, 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 it's, it's a contradiction. But I think that's different. I think relief is different from showering, you know, and development and so on. It's, it's relief from uh, what, what is like new uh, coercion, but, it's, but then it's you're on your own and, and we won't bother you unless you do it again, in which case we will bother you and we will isolate you uh, and we will press you. So I, I think there has to be a lot of pressure, especially when we have fundamentally different interests in so many different domains. So if there is a nuclear deal, my argument would be that puts, it's like putting gloves on in a fight. It's you say, all right, we're going to fight, but let's put gloves on so we don't kill each other. Uh, and then we'll fight in other ways. We'll fight on politics. We'll fight on human rights. We'll fight on relations uh, in the Gulf. We'll fight on Israel. Uh, and they know that, and we know that. It's the, a nuclear deal would say, let's just take nuclear weapons off the, off the table. That seems to me the best we're going we're gonna to accomplish. Uh, I don't think we need to worry about uh, an economic aid package for Iran, because right now they're on track to get the sanctions lifted and achieve a nuclear weapons capability. Really, what could go wrong? Well, uh, ladies and gents, uh, unlike the discussions in Lausanne, we actually <laughs> do have a deadline, and we've reached it. Um, please join me in thanking our speakers for an informative and thought-provoking and also enjoyable session.